I'm really glad to see people here. Um, a lot of times we don't have people that want to talk about suicide prevention. So I'm really glad that you're here. And that tells me that you probably had some struggles with this in your school um, at responding to suicide prevention and that leads to suicide prevention as well. So I want to thank you from here. Um, I also just want to set the, the tone to, um, to ask everybody to not make assumptions about um, what experiences your colleagues on this call have or have not had, and that we just keep it extra respectful and not make assumptions about um, people's opinions and um, what, they, what they think about suicide um, and suicide prevention. So we're going to be presenting to you a, a model school district policy on suicide prevention. And... Uh, we're really excited about it. If you have not heard of this, it has it is now in its second edition. So um, with that, I will let Sheena take it away. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. So before we begin, um, like Victoria said, it's tough to talk about this topic. Sometimes it's tough to talk about behavioral health in general, but definitely tough to talk about suicide. So we want to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves all the time, but especially during this presentation. And this is not an easy topic to talk about. Uh, we, some of us may have experienced or um, had somebody in our lives who suicide affected or they're an attempt survivor, or you may be an attempt survivor. Um, a lot of times, never mind, even if you don't have that direct experience, working with folks and especially working with kids, we experience something called compassion fatigue, right? We know this. We want to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. So a couple brief resources for you. We have up there on the screen the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline up there. And I also want to reference you to the New Mexico Crisis and Access Line, and maybe somebody can pop that number in the chat box, that would be great. Um, I want to remind you that both of those resources are for someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis or emergency or suicidality, or you don't have to be the person experiencing that to call. Uh, maybe you know somebody else or just wanting to know what resources are there. So we want to make sure that you have those resources. And also, um, on I think almost all the back of all of your insurance cards, depending on what insurance you have, almost all of them are there. Um, you will have a mental health number on the back of your, your card as well. So really quickly, I would like you all to think about how do you know when you're not okay? How do I know when I'm not okay? I know that when I'm not okay, I start snapping at my kids, right? And that's a signal for me where I need to chill out and take some time for myself. So I'm going to ask you all to take just a brief moment, put in the chat box, how do you know when you're not okay? What does that look like for you? What does that feel like for you? I'll give you all just a minute. Not sleeping well, yep. Tunnel vision, low energy. Sudden bursts of anger, frustration, low energy. We're all human, but we're all very different. We all react different ways. And it's really important that we identify that we, how we know when we're not okay, so we can identify those, those signals. So snapping at family, low energy and motivation, rapid breathing, being quiet. Thank you all so much for adding those in. So um, just a reminder, take care of yourself all of the time, know when you're not okay and know when it's time for some self-care. Um, if today is not the day for you to be talking about suicide or suicide prevention, that is absolutely okay. We will have this presentation recorded, please reach out to us. We're happy to talk to you in any way that we can or get you this information afterwards, but we don't want you to have to sit through this presentation with a lump in your throat and getting a migraine. Um, please do not do that to yourself, but make sure you reach out to somebody um, and, and talk that through. Next slide. So we're gonna do a poll on our next slide here. What suicide prevention programs or curriculums does your school or district currently use? Okay, so it looks like, let's see, we've got 13% um, for ASSIST, which is Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer, 13%. Mental Health First Aid, that makes me happy to see. Youth Mental Health First Aid, 38%. Safe Schools, 25%. 
Uh, 13% Jason Foundation, great, Breaking the Silence, 25%. Awesome, thank you so much for participating in that. Um, and again, if you all don't know what your district uses, we absolutely encourage you to be a part of that, be a part of that planning. So when we talk about suicide and we talk about suicide prevention, language is incredibly important. Um, we can all agree that within our state and nationally and worldwide, there is stigma around mental and behavioral health and there's definitely stigma around suicide. When we use stigmatizing language, that then in turn increases the stigma. But when we use destigmatizing relationship or what we like to call recovery friendly language, that can then destigmatize the topic. Um, not trying to make y'all the language police. Please don't go up to somebody and scream at them because they're using the wrong language. What we want to do is model that destigmatizing language and get others to see and hear how we're speaking. So we've heard folks use the word or say that someone completed suicide or successfully completed suicide. Real quick in the chat box, what else do you successfully complete in your life or hope to successfully complete? School, a college degree, absolutely. And so when we successfully complete those, everybody goes, yay, good job, right? Things that are good. Why are we putting that term with suicide, right? We've also heard someone say that someone committed suicide. This is a pretty common term. Again, in the chat box, what else would you commit? Hopefully you don't. What else you might, where might you hear that word? Crime, absolutely right? Burglary, murder. That's not a yay, you did it. They throw you in jail for that. That's, there's a legal connotation there. So why are we putting that term with suicide? Um, true story, my father died by cancer, but we don't say that he committed cancer. That's weird, right? We say that he died by cancer. So we want to use the same terminology with suicide, right? That individual died by suicide because that's the facts and that's what happened, right? Suicide loss survivors, the common term that you may hear folks talk about, a suicide loss survivor is someone who has lost somebody else to suicide. I am a suicide loss survivor, okay? Suicide attempt survivor, this is an individual, an individual who has attempted suicide but has not died by suicide, okay? So again, just some terminology, language changes, we don't want to be the language police, but remember, we want to remember to model the destigmatizing language. Okay, so how do we prevent suicide? The short answer is, is we increase protective factors and we decrease risk factors. This is a very brief list, not all inclusive. There are some brief examples here of what a protective factor may be and what a risk factor may be. And as you look through these lists, Think about how you as an individual, you as a family member, a friend, a coworker, or you as an employee in your job with the children and coworkers that you work with. How do we increase protective factors? Look at the very first one on protective factors. That's school, right? School in itself is a protective factor. Um, we can do we can do suicide prevention at every age. And we hear a lot of folks go, no, 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 we can't do it for little ones. Yes, we can, but it looks different right? This is how we do suicide prevention for little ones, right? I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. We work on this every day. How do we increase protective factors and decrease risk factors? That doesn't mean we're talking about suicide specifically at that age. That doesn't mean, you know, at, at you know, every level, elementary, pre-K, whatever it is, we can't hit affect suicide prevention. We absolutely can. And we can do that by increasing protective factors and decreasing risk factors. So another thing to sit back and think about when you have a second to do so is how do I do that with my kids, right? So let's talk a little bit about data, and what we look like regarding suicide within our nation, within our state. Um, so everything that we know about suicide, how are we doing very clearly, we can do better. Um, you see that 24% increase from 2000 to 2012. I wanna remind you here that all of the data and the rates we're looking at is the rate per 100,000 people, okay? Um, so clearly we know that we can be doing better. So another snapshot, suicide deaths in the US, you can see all the way down there at the bottom from 2010 to 2018, we have done nothing but increase in our numbers. 
Um, you've got our latest 2018 data up there for suicide deaths in the US, 48,344. We hear a lot about COVID numbers right now, I'm not saying one is more important than the other. That being said, suicide is something that is a consistent issue that has gone up, right? Think about vaping for a second. We know vaping is an issue with kids, adolescents, even younger, it's an issue in school. Um, cigarettes before that. That being said, it's something that the rates have gone up and then we put, we intervened and then they went back down. Suicide deaths, we can, the rates just continue to go up and we continue to intervene, but they continue to rise, right? So we need, we need to look at how we're, how we're impacting these. So again, 6,211 young people. When we talk about this, we're talking about ages 15 to 24 in the U.S. died by suicide in 2018. That's one suicide every two hours. For every one suicide, there are 25 attempts for each documented death. And I want you to think about this data for a second, right? Because what about the attempts that we don't know about, right? And I'll speak for Victoria because she usually does this slide. But that being said, as, as school folks who work with kids every single day, how many times have you heard a kid say, well, yeah, I took some pills last night and I tried to die, but didn't work. So I showed up at school the next day. That's not a documented attempt, right? So we know these numbers, but we also know that they're probably higher because of those attempts or deaths that were not documented. Um, I also want to reference the suicide deaths. We know that if a, for a suicide to be classified a suicide, they have to have proof, whether that's a note, we have to have proof that that is a suicide. Think about a single car accident. Think about an overdose that the family member or friend may know it's intentional, but we can't prove that. Those are all deaths by suicide that aren't attached to this data. So taking that into an account. Um, again, that's 48,000 suicides translates to 1.2 million attempts every year that we know of. We have the suicide, 2018 suicide rates. And again, I remind you that's per 100,000 by state. Um, so you see there, New Mexico, again, is at the top of a list that we do not like to be at the top of. Um, we are number one again for 2018 with 25.6 deaths per 100,000. You see down at the bottom, the US rate is 14.8. We are well above that. Um, and I encourage you to look at the other states on there. And a lot of people think Alaska has the highest suicide rate. A lot of times we are higher than Alaska. Um, and if you're from another state, I encourage you to look at where you're at within that ranking. The top you know, three to four states tend to jump up and down, but they tend to stay within the top five from year to year. So you see the map of the United States here on the left. And this is something um, called what is referred to as the suicide belt, right? And New Mexico is there within that shaded area. So I ask you real briefly in the chat box, what all those states have in common? Native population, mountains. Okay, Francis, take that one step further. What mountains run through all of those states? Rural setting, are there other rural states? Absolutely, lack of mental health, gun restriction, Rocky Mountains, there we go, good job, Francis. Um, absolutely, and yes, there are the similarities with other things that folks put up in their native population. Gun laws, Texas isn't highlighted, right? We know that they've got some intense um, stuff going on. That being said, it is the Rocky Mountains. So there is a theory, right? that within the Rocky Mountains, we know that when we go up higher in altitude, we have a lack of oxygen. Thank you, Victoria, for putting that up in the chat box. When we have a lack of oxygen, what happens to you, right? Some folks get dizzy. Sometimes you get short of breath. Your skin might turn blue. You might get nauseous, right? That's, ex let's, you know, if we're hiking to the top of the Rocky Mountains or Mount Everest, which we're not, right? We have oxygen deprivation. And sometimes within that ox oxygen deprivation, our judgment isn't quite there. Like, oh yeah, I can totally jump over that big giant ravine and make it, right? Oxygen deprivation is, is a key there. Now, we, we function in New Mexico right about a mile high, depending on where you're at. That being said, we're not hiking Mount Everest, but we are functioning at a slight level of oxygen deprivation all of the time, right? Within that, we're not hiking Mount Everest, so we're not, you know, puking and fainting all of the time. But that being said, oxygen deprivation, 
affects our sleep patterns, where even though we feel like we're getting good sleep, we're not getting as good a sleep as we do at sleep level. And that consistent ox oxygen deprivation has been shown to affect suicide, okay? Um, and Victoria put up there in the chat box, um, there have been many, many studies done also duplicated in Spain, Turkey, and the US military, showing that ox can, oxygen deprivation can be involved in those suicide rates. So again, something to think about. One of the other things too, is when you take a medication, like for example, um, an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety, the absorption rate of that medication is less at a higher altitude than it is at sea level. Please, I am not telling you to go take extra amounts of your pills. That is absolutely not what we're saying, but your body absorbs that medication at a lesser rate at a higher elevation. Um, there are some folks who are doing studies, which I won't speak about because I don't know in depth about those studies, who are doing studies to look at possibly adding some things into medication for folks who are um, into mental health medication for folks that are at a higher altitude to help with that absorption rate. So again, another thing to think about. And thank you, Victoria, for putting that up in the chat box. So suicide rates in New Mexico, um, I will not read this to you. I think it's pretty clear. This is by year from 2008 to 2018. Had a couple dips there, but we've got a pretty steady decline um, all the way up through 2018 here in New Mexico. So this is small here. I hope you all can see it. I wanna explain the two different maps here. So the map on the left is ages zero to 14. <coughs> I want to remind you again that these rates are per 100,000. So we know that we've got very, really rural areas here in New Mexico. Has nothing to do with it. We're looking at per 100,000. So zero to 14, a lot of folks say, oh, we don't have suicides within that range. We absolutely do. Um, both Victoria and I sit on the Child Fatality Review Board. Um, and I think the in 2017, the youngest individual who we had was 12, if I remember correctly. Victoria, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we're starting to see that again um, and even younger in the next years. So you can look at all of the different counties and the colors, and I'll explain this to you because it's hard to see. When you look at the darker red, that's three to four deaths per 100,000, okay? And then as you go down, so you see Bernalillo County there, dark red, that's three to four deaths per 100,000. The map on the right, this is ages 15 to 24. Those blue areas, that dark blue is 24 to 30 deaths per 100,000. So you see the difference there. I encourage you to find your county. Um, I also draw your attention to the map on the right. You'll see there are areas and in counties that are white. They're not that cream color. Those are counties that have chosen to, sub not, to not submit their data. Um, there's, you know, we could talk forever about that. Yes, they are supposed to submit their data, but they don't have to. We as a state do submit our data to the CDC. There are states that choose not to do that. So we are missing some data throughout our state. All right, here's a part that I'm really excited about. And I am definitely one of the people you, are, you will meet that is excited about suicide prevention. I, I don't think there's too many things that are as cool as possibly preventing suicide and saving people's lives. So, um, so forgive me if I'm passionate and happy about suicide prevention because I just, I love it so much um, and have done it for years and now get to do it all the time as part of my job. So um, what we're introducing to you really, the, the gist of, of this talk today is introducing you to the model school district policy on suicide prevention. It's model language that um, it has already been written and researched and is ready to go. It's sort of fill in the blank. Um, if you're familiar with this at all, it, it came out in, I believe, um, 2014, and then it came out, uh, it was redone again in 2019. And so this is the 2019 content. I think it is worth looking at the older version just because it, it had more of a checklist, but we're just gonna go through some of the components, talk about them, explain them a little bit, and um, all with the hope that you would take this back to your work setting and consider using this um, to recraft, review, or even construct a suicide prevention policy at the district level. So um, know that your, your school safety plan does require you to put something in there for suicide prevention that's already required of every brick and mortar school in New Mexico in that school safety plan that's submitted to the PED. 
So this, this really fits into that, that spot really well for everybody. And a lot of folks don't know that this exists. So this, um, this document, this model language was put together by four entities that I don't think have collaborated on anything before, as far as I know. So it's pretty exciting. It's the American School Counseling Association, the National Association of School Psychologists, the Trevor Project for reducing LGBTQ suicide, and then the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So um, I'm sure everybody's probably heard of at least one of those, hopefully, and maybe even all of them, but they worked together, they collaborated to come up with this document, and, and I, they did all the work for us already. Um, and that, that's really exciting. So here's just a list, and when you look in the table of contents, the model policy language here that's listed under these bullet points. And we're just going to go through those and, and talk about them a little bit so you are familiarized with them. But definitely this is the kind of document that you would go back and you would uh, download or print out and take it and construct a new policy or take the policy that you already have and start cross-referencing and looking to see um, what components maybe are missing, what ones you already have covered really well and, and seeing how closely you align with this document. So that's, that's really our purpose here is to help you um, get on track for doing that. Next slide. So the purpose. The purpose, of course, is to protect the health and well-being of all students by having these some procedures in place, right? Um, having that on paper so everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Um, so things happen the way they're supposed to happen. People know what they're supposed to recognize, what they're supposed to look for, what training they're supposed to get, what their responsibility is. It's super easy to say, I am drowning with all the things I'm mandated to do. And you're going to put one more thing on me. But the way I look at this is, this is, this is basic safety. This is keeping youth alive. So that's very foundational um, in a school setting, that we keep our youth alive, right? That's, that's, you talk about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We have to keep people safe before we can do anything else for them. So that's really what uh, this is all about. And, and acknowledging that the school is part of that acknowledging that to the school, acknowledging that to the community, and everybody agreeing that, yes, this is something we're going to engage in. We already have everyone work on fire safety. We have fire drills, evacuations, shelters in place, things like that. Depending on your part of the country, you might do hurricane and tsunami drills and earthquake drills. So this is right up there with any other kind of safety um, drills, any kind of safety policies that we already have in place. We store chemicals in a safe place in schools. If we do that, then are we responsible for being able to know when somebody might be considering suicide? Of course, sure we are. So um, that, that speaks to purpose. Next slide, please, is scope. What is the scope of this, this whole model policy thing here? Um, it, it covers like any other policy. Typical school policy talks about in school, it talks about outside of school in, in the way of after school programs, it talks about sports, activities, events, school sponsored activities, events, school sponsored trips, things like that. So it falls right in line. It's nothing wildly different than all the other policies that we write and that we review and edit and update and revise. So um, just for those of you that may be a little bit unfamiliar with making policies and, and revising them, this applies in the same way as, as anything else. And it goes the extra mile, which a lot of school policies should, of informing the community and caregivers, informing the school community, the entire school community of what the policy is and what people are supposed to do. It's not helpful to have a policy that says a uh, parent guardian is more than welcome to call the school and say, I'm worried about this youth that was at my house um, hanging out with my kiddo and they seem super depressed and I'm worried the way they were talking, I think they might wanna die. It's not helpful to have a policy that addresses what they should do if you don't share that with them. They need to know that they can call the school and that they should call the school right away. And if they can't get a hold of the school, that they can call the lifeline or the New Mexico crisis and access line. So the scope is like any other policy with that extra step as many policies of, hey, parents, guardians, families, community, 
this is what we're doing and this is your piece in it. So it does go kind of that, that extra step. Next slide. It does go through definitions, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but know that it does go through definitions so that when you integrate this policy or write this new policy or revise yours, that everybody's on the same page with their language. They mean the same thing. So the, this is an example on this slide of some of the things that are defined in this model policy, which you'll see in any other school policy. There are certain terms that do need to be defined so that, that everyone is understanding things in the same way. And there's the distinction, um, if you look on the right column, between suicide and attempt, suicide behavior, suicide ideation, suicide contagion is a huge fear in schools because they're their own community. Schools, with, whether we love it or not, schools are their own community within a community and contagion is a real thing that can happen. So it does talk about contagion. There is a body of literature on contagion. It is not mysterious on how I handle contagion. It's very scary. Absolutely, um, but we know what to do. So um, it addresses that and addresses non-suicidal self-injury. Uh, some folks struggle with that even in mental health professionals, definitely outside mental health professionals um, that are, are educators and not in the mental health field, sometimes struggle with that definition, what it is, what it means. So it, it provides that. And if you're not sure yet, I am trying to sell you this model. I love it. I would love for everybody to use it. And, and spread it far and wide, um, it, and it's free and it's research-based. So um, going forward with that, with that, our next slide is on prevention. So each one of these topics in the table of contents has a whole section. And I just pulled out a few things from each section. Definitely, if you are going to embark on revising your school policy or writing a school policy from scratch, you'll want to print or download this thing and familiarize yourself with each section um, intimately and maybe even break that up in a team to do a, a policy right or rewrite. So prevention is the next topic that it talks about. A lot of what we do, um, it's been my experience in New Mexico schools, we have so many things going on and we have so many responsibilities that it's a little bit of a we're in reaction mode all the time and we wait for somebody to suddenly get to us that is in crisis for suicidality. And, and what we're really doing is intervention and safety. And we, a lot of the time, don't really get that opportunity to do real prevention. Prevention meaning you're helping youth with things that will be protective factors so that they might not even become suicidal. Not meaning they won't be sad or have really hard times in their lives, but they will have the problem solving skills and abilities and coping mechanisms in place that they would not see suicide as an option. So that's real prevention and that promotion of mental health wellness. So that's what this prevention section, a lot of that is about um, and, and addresses changing culture. Um, this talks about K-12 prevention. Shana mentioned it earlier. Some folks think, oh, we can't say suicide prevention to a um, you know, a, a seven-year-old. We can't talk about suicide prevention because what's the first question that comes up when you say that? What's suicide, right? And we don't have to even talk about suicide prevention, but we can do things and teach them at seven years old that actually is suicide prevention, like increasing protective factors and, and teaching them how to be resilient when times are hard. So um, there's a lot we can do K through 12 for actual prevention, whether it's curriculum, whether it's a culture change in the school, whether it's putting up posters and changing the culture of that school, but really addressing those risk factors and warning signs, as well as the resiliency and the protective factors. So I wanna, I wanna kinda highlight that since the, um, many times we think of secondary when we think of prevention and curriculum. Intervention, and there should be a written pr written procedure for what the prevention plan is. There should be the same thing. For intervention. If my if my audio gets really bad, tell me, um, and Shana will jump in. I'm hearing clicking sounds, so just want to touch base on that. So intervention intervention is when we have determined somebody might be suicidal, or they have told us they're suicidal, and we need to do some assessment and referral. 
and we need to work with that at-risk at youth. Um, and we need to have written policy. Part of this whole policy, this whole thing is about policy language, model policy. And um, we should have a written procedure for why and when you would contact law enforcement. Um, there's, there's a lot of assumption and um, some, some biases and different things that go along with calling law enforcement during uh, an event where you are working with somebody who's suicidal. So we really need to be cognizant of that. And best case is that we have a policy that actually is written out when you would call law enforcement. Um, an example of one of those is when I, I was involved with um, the youth ran out of the school building and off school property. I needed help getting them fast. So that was a time where I felt like, yeah, I don't have the help I need. I need somebody that can go and look in that direction while I look in this direction. And I involved law enforcement. Um, I know examples that have turned terribly wrong too, where we, where we tell families, you need to go get an assessment for this youth. And they say, no, nah, they're, they're full of it. We're, various other reactions, right? And we say, well, if you don't, I'm going to call the cops on you. And that's not exactly what we, we would say would be the best scenario to, to try to kind of um, tools. So this just talks about, there's a whole section on this, um, of, of what that might look like for you. And it's going to be written differently for every district, of course, for sure. So the next topic it goes to is parental notification and involvement. And definitely important to pay attention to that first line there. When you write this kind of policy that's talking about life and death, you definitely need to consult your, uh, whatever attorney is working with your district, okay, to make sure that they can go through everything and it's worded correctly and, it's, and that it's doable for you with the staff that you have. Um, there are ethical guidelines involved for every different role group. If you sit down a social worker, a school nurse, a school counselor, school psychologist, an administrator, and ask them what their ethical guidelines are on one of these scenarios, they're going to come up with different answers. That's why they're ethical guidelines, right? Um, it is a gray area. So we need to make sure that everyone feels comfortable with what the policy that's written says. So consult your legal and then all your role groups that are going to be involved. Certainly would be a misstep to write something about law enforcement and their role and then never bring them to the table and sit down and talk to them about that, right? Same thing with an administrator. Everybody needs to know ahead of time. That's why it's, it's, a, it's a policy. Everybody knows ahead of time how it's going to go, right? Um, so is anybody familiar with that C-A-L-M, that CALM, including CALM in your parent notifications? Um, I put parental notification because that's what it says in the policy, but it should be parent and guardian, right? Um, CALM is counseling on access to legal means. And that means that not only when we call you in and say, hey, you know, I've been working with your sixth grader and they express to me some things that make me feel like they're, they're wanting to die, um, or, you know, even more heightened that we're really concerned about their safety this moment, but we're doing this notification and involvement of the caretaker we're remiss if we leave out that important chunk to remind them about access to lethal means at home. We go to extraordinary length to keep youth safe in the school building, in the classroom, on the playground, on the bus, on the sidewalk, in the crosswalk. Um, they're, they're pretty darn safe at school as things go, right? So um, if we bring somebody in and we tell them something that's probably going to really stress them out a lot, um, they may not be thinking about what the home setting is like for, for that youth. And so we have to remind them. And the way we do that is counseling on access to lethal means. So that is a piece of this. And we could do a whole hour and a half just on calm, but we won't. Um, and then as a district, seeking a release of information with whatever provider you may be sending them off to or whoever they decide to go to, or it might even be an emergency department. But seeking that out ahead of time, so this is all, all um, laid out before it ever happens, how things are going to go, it makes it yeah, a lot easier, because these things are stressful for everybody. The next topic is the re-entry procedure. And you want to maintain, there's something called continuum of care, especially with suicide prevention, that we don't just kind of drop somebody off and expect them to pick right back up and go into the classroom and act like nothing ever happened. 
And so um, reentry can really set the tone for, for your school, for that individual, for that youth, and even for that family, that parent guardian. Um, it's it's kind of devastating when you go through this referral process with the, the youth and their caretaker and they go away and they get an assessment and then they come back to school oftentimes the next morning, oftentimes, and we don't really know what to say to them and we don't have anything in place formally. Um, it's it's, it's kind of like if you've ever had anybody in your life die and you come back to work and everybody knows about it, but nobody knows what to say and they kind of look at you, kind of stigmatizes what happened for you. Um, it makes you feel kind of alone. And so having a re-entry entry procedure that's a part of the written policy can help destigmatize and it can help connect family, school, provider, and keep that communication and that care going. The next one is dealing with a lot of school folks' worst nightmare, which is in-school suicide attempts. So um, this is fairly rare, but it definitely does happen in New Mexico for sure. Maybe some of you know people that, that have um, had to experience this it's really difficult, but there are some um, rote procedures that you can follow. There should be. People shouldn't have to make it up as they go along when they're extremely stressed. Um, they're worried. Some people, this is very traumatizing for some folks. So let's have a written procedure. So one of the bullet points in this um, model policy language is in school suicide attempts. I have a little picture there if you can see it. Some of you may have heard of Our Lady of the Angels School in Chicago back in 1958. Um, after that, so that was a terrible school fire and there were fatalities. And because of that fire across the whole country, um, that's kind of where school fire drills came from. Fire poles, fire drills, and not locking doors from the inside to keep the kiddos inside safe. We don't chain the doors from the inside anymore. That used to be a thing. Since this horrible, horrible fire happened in 1958, we haven't had any students die in a school fire at all. And I bring this up because I just want to hit this home. We still do fire drills, right? It's part of law. Um, there are fire pools, some schools Schools still have the axes behind the glass and um, uh, the, the, we've done so well with school fires that we have not had a youth death since this fire. So I want to say, couldn't we do the same thing with suicide prevention? Could we have zero suicide for schools? Because we have done so much for prevention. We've done drills. We've created policies. We've put money towards it to make sure it doesn't happen. We've made things so safe that we don't have these suicides. And I just challenge you to turn that over in your mind and think, is that really possible? Can we do that? What do we need to do that? We made it happen for fires and we were successful at it. Just a reminder, we were successful at that. So the um, next slide is out of school suicide attempts, which is much more common than an in school suicide attempt. Uh, it talks about what needs to be in place. The model policy language covers that there needs to be a procedure, not just a policy a procedure, what people should actually do. Kind of tells you there, that's the very basic form of what it would look like. Also depends on how, how the emergency rolls out. And the thing that we really drive home with everybody is, and that is forgotten a lot in the school setting because we juggle so much um, is that sometimes we leave somebody alone who is in danger. It's a lot easier to not leave somebody alone when they're bleeding actively. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna stay here with you. But when it's a mental health issue, sometimes we feel like I can leave them in this office if I go do this thing over here real quick or they can wait, or they can wait to the bell. Um, and this really talks about not doing that and staying, staying with somebody, but it also tells me what to do when, when um, a lot of times staff, maybe they'll receive a message from a youth. And sometimes even on the weekend has been my experience of, 
the student trusts me and they message me even over the actual school system that we're using of how they're feeling and I'm terrified and I don't know what to do. You hear people say constantly I did, and I don't know what to do from here. Um, and uh, sometimes I say, well, what would you do if it was your next door neighbor? Well, I would call 911 and I would go over there. Okay, do you do anything you possibly can. Um, and and it really outlines this. Again, I don't want to tell you how you should do it. I'm telling you this is definitely the document to use to make sure you have the best policy and procedure in place for your school. Uh, the next slide talks about after suicide death. Shana gave you the numbers to look at. Of We have around 500 suicides a year. Of those 500, we have approximately 100 or are youth considered youth suicides? Okay, with the majority of those being in the teen years typically. So we know this, this is definitely an issue. And when we know that every time we have one of those deaths, it impacts a ton of people. And we know in a school setting, if you have a suicide death, it impacts the whole school typically, and as well as the community. It's not a, a small event that, you know, nobody's going to find out about it. We just don't talk about it. Just some people's default. It's their default to want to be quiet. Um, understandably, but that's not helpful. So after suicide death, this gives you a little list of seven actions. It's a place to start. It's not the be all end all, but they're trying to give you, um, if you could go one more slide, Susan. So these, um, this is, you know, don't type this in as your policy and call it good. There needs to be uh, bullets under each one of these, right? But um, we, time and time again, and I'll tell you, I have been on the receiving end of incorrect information as a school employee, as a school counselor, um, that get the facts is so much more important than I can ever tell you um, because the facts change a lot. Um, we're starting to learn that in our pandemic, right? The facts change and we have to be right before we go and start talking to people. Um, we have to assess the situation of what these facts, what, what do they mean for us right now? Sharing information, what should we share? Who should we share with? Those are very important questions. And those should be answered by a team of people. There are right ways and there are definitely wrong ways to share information. And I just want to put in a plug of always be age appropriate. So how to initiate support services, what support services, what do you have? All this should be worked out prior. And I hope that you draw up an amazing plan using this document and you never have to use it. That would be, that would be best and share it with other districts and schools. So um, there are guidelines on memorializing. Um, these things have all been addressed. These things are not new. So um, the, the most unaddressed thing really is postvention when it comes to after a suicide death. The last thing most adults want to do is to drag it out or open that can of worms. I've heard those a lot and we absolutely don't want to drag it out and we don't want to open a can of worms, but we do because if we don't open a can of worms, we don't know which worms need help. Um, and I just have gone beyond opening a can of worms these days. We, we need to open a can of worms. We need to talk to people. We need to make sure they're okay. And we can even have conversations where we don't know. We think it was a suicide because Facebook said it was a suicide, but we don't know and nobody will tell us. We can still talk to a youth who says, I think my friend killed himself. And we can say, wow, that sounds so hard. Do you want to talk to me? I'm willing to talk to you. And I don't have to tell you whether or not what you heard is right. And I can tell you, I don't know either. So we can still have those conversations and we can still have postvention. The next one is sample language for student handbook. It actually has it in there that you can copy all you want, word for word, if you would like. Um, but it'll get everybody on the same track and reduce stigma and make a big, if you put this in, it, it's been difficult. I've seen some districts um, really struggle to get this into the student handbook, but man, look at all the other stuff your student handbook covers. It covers behavior, it covers dress code, you know, um, emergency procedures, all kinds of stuff about how to be in school and be safe in school. And if we can't promote the mental health and wellness of preventing suicide in our, our handbook. I'm not totally sure what we're doing if we're leaving that out. 
um, but it, get, it gives you um, some ideas about what you should put in there and even a good start or an after the print type of thing that you can do is stickers, labels. We didn't put it in, but we were slapping this thing on the back and everybody knows that here's the phone number. Just getting your foot in the door and saying, I'd like to put the Lifeline hotline number plastered on the back of our, our student handbook, starting even there. Um, but check out that section and I'll tell you more about what you might need to look at. So the next section is what's inside, um, commentary. So it covers some other kind of uh, topics that people start to ask about after they read the full first section and say, wow, this is a lot. Maybe we need to make a lot of changes. And then these questions start coming up about what, well, what does parent involvement look like? What, how, do, what's school-based mental health role in that? Do they all get um, referred to that? Um, some things I want to talk about, well, Shane is going to talk about the, I think, going to talk about the bullying and suicide, but um, it, it, brings up all the really conversational things that come up when you're trying to construct these, these policies and procedures and, and that um, hopefully covering the majority of the things that might trip you up a little bit as you go. And I'll hand it over to my friend, Shana. Thank you so much. So in talking about all of this, <clears throat> there's some other areas that need to be involved, right? One of those is parent and guardian, guardian involvement, right? We know that we want to keep the investment, the understanding of parents and guardians to understand what is the school doing to protect my child, right? And as a parent, that's extremely important to me, right? I, I wanna know what that school has in place and when we implement the model policy, it's all right there and it's very easy to be able to explain to a parent, look, this is what we have involved, this is what we have here to be able to be proactive and what we have to support a student proactively and also in crisis. Um, community support and the continuum of care is extremely important and that includes the parent or guardian. Sometimes we forget that and we think about that continuum of care. We think about community providers. We think about maybe acute care providers if that's part of the situation, but we want to remember to include the parent and guardian in that as well. Um, the importance of school-based mental health supports. Uh, we just finished up a presentation this morning regarding a wonderful framework, um, which is the National Curriculum for Behavioral Health in Schools, which is the A to Z framework of how do we implement behavioral health programs in schools. Um, there is a wonderful assessment called the SHAPE Assessment, and uh, we can probably put those links in the chat box for you or if you, or if you attended our previous presentation, I think it's recorded as well. The SHAPE Assessment is a great tool. It's all free, by the way. Everything I'm talking to you about is free. And you can go online and complete that SHAPE Assessment with a multidisciplinary team to be able to say, okay, where are we at within our school? What are we doing to support our kids? And it goes through all the different domain areas and, and it's not about replacing with a whole nother curriculum and everybody's rolling their eyes and their head going, oh my God, it's another thing. This is really a framework. It takes what you're already doing, measures its impact and allows everything to really talk and work together. Um, the entire school community should be well versed in risk and protective factors. We wanna offer training to our staff, offer training to our community, not just the students and the, and the staff who are in school. We wanna offer training to everyone. Like Victoria said, we know that schools are the safest place for kids, but it's when they leave schools. And so how can schools impact that? It's providing that training, that support, whether it's training on protective and risk factors, whether it's suicide prevention training like QPR or ASSIST or any of the other ones that we talked about before is offering that to the entire community. Um, and the Suicide Prevention Task Force, building a team and getting the community involved, not just from the school, not leaving it all on administration or the teachers or whoever it is, not leaving it all on their shoulders, but getting the community involved <clears throat> and really building that Suicide Prevention Task Force to prevent. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about different groups that are at higher risk, right? we bring up LGBTQ youth. I want to remind you all that it's not being LGBTQ, LGBTQ that increases risk. It's how LGBTQ people are treated that increases their risk, right? 
Um, we want to be really careful about assuming or outing, quote unquote, a student, right? We don't want to say, oh, well, you know, they had this attempt because they identify as LGBTQ. That's not our role to do that. So we really want to be mindful of that. Um, and then talking about, like Victoria referenced, the relationship between bullying and suicide. That relationship is highly complex as there's a relationship between suicide and other negative life, effect, life events as well. Research indicates that persistent bullying can lead to or worsen feelings of isolation. We see this a lot. And I know there was a comment in the chat box as well. Um, those persistent bullying can lead to feelings of isolation, rejection, exclusion and despair, as well as depression and anxiety, um, which can contribute to suicide behavior for those at risk. <clears throat> we need to remember that it's not the actual act of bullying, just like it's not identifying as LGBTQ makes you at a higher risk. It's the effect of, and that's the same thing with bullying. And so again, I wanna bring you back to those risk factors and protective factors. And when we can really increase those protective factors, it's going to decrease the risk for those at risk. Next slide. Victoria. All right, we're getting towards the home stretch here soon, folks. Um, the, the last part is points to consider when developing reentry policies. So a school, I just want to be really clear because I've had this question asked so many times. A school cannot require a student or their parents or their guardian provide documentation of a mental health assessment or a mental health release before they're allowed to reenter following a mental health crisis. Okay. Um, that's really hard for a lot of folks, but um, to, to understand, um, but this is also speaks to why we need to have plans in place of what happens when someone returns from a mental health crisis, whether that's hospitalization or not, or they return from having an assessment that says they are at high risk and they're going to return to school. There are, uh, it's, it can be a complex issue, but Basically, we can't discriminate against and withhold access to education on account of somebody's mental health status. So um, I just, I just want to kind of push that notion um, to make sure that we're all clear on that. But we need, to, we need to help with the bridge. We have a lot of providers and hospitals that don't suggest a release of information when they um, discharge a patient that's been there for suicidality or even an attempt. Um, there's discharge paperwork and the family doesn't always know what they should do with that. Should they give it to the school? Should they not give it to the school? How do I get the school to talk to the provider or the person that did the evaluation or assessment? But those are important questions to have answered before you're ever in this position. And the recommendation always is that we, as a school, would promote that continuum of care, meaning that there would be a release of information and it's up to the family if they want to sign that or not. But releasing information to where the school can talk to the provider and say, what are the recommendations that are here at school? What can we do to help? Um, because otherwise we have to ask the family that. And it's um, really helpful to be able to get everybody on the same page together and for the school to facilitate that. So uh, just throwing that out there. But, um, you know, we talk at there, some schools do safety plans, some schools don't do safety plans, some emergency departments will do safety plans, but not necessarily with a school component where the youth spends most of their time at school. Um, how do you say safe for yourself at school and who, who can you talk to at uh, school if you don't feel safe? Um, and in that bottom bullet of CYFD reports when necessary, make no mistake, if someone is suicidal, that does not equal a mandatory call to CYFD. It's not a mandatory call. The only reason you would call CYFD is if you felt like um, what, whatever maybe was making them feel suicidal, if, if that was some sort of endangerment or neglect or abuse, then absolutely. And of course, you always wanna err on the side of reporting um, you can call and ask, is this the kind of thing I should report? And sometimes you get a reaction from a family or um, a guardian that you don't feel is conducive to that youth getting help or is downright maybe inappropriate or dangerous or neglectful. So, um, but you don't have to call CFD every time a youth is in, and you shouldn't call every time a youth displays a suicidal behavior or 
um, or even you know says they're suicidal or, or even if they made an attempt um, that's not an immediate CYFD call just just to make that extra clear so um, and, you, and you can't require any kind of release for them to come back from that so the next slide is a continuation of uh, developing reentry procedures and policies of course you want to familiarize yourself with relevant state laws again we probably could have made the whole talk about relevant state laws if we wanted to um, you're going to need to have somebody help you with legal consider the district liability and i'll tell you what there's much larger liability because there's precedence for school districts and school folks getting sued um, and losing that lawsuit if if um if a court felt that they didn't do all that they should so some some folks feel like oh i shouldn't get involved because then i'm liable well you're liable whether you get involved in or not um, and knowing what you should do and not having that in place and not adopting that and implementing that if you don't do that you're much more liable than just ignoring it and hoping it doesn't happen for you so i want to throw that out there um, and, and there are great, amazing guides at Last Bullet, Messaging and Suicide Contagion. There are great guides on reducing contagion and, and what messaging, meaning prevention messaging, um, what that should look like and what is most helpful for everyone and including youth. Um, and the, the short of that is if you ignore in your messaging and you act like nothing happened, that can actually promote contagion and then being um, negative and, and allowing things to become negative rather than providing, um, hey, hey, families, this is what we're doing. And here's a number, here's resources, that kind of thing is what prevents contagion. So, um, but there's more to that in, in the model policy language. And I, I invite you to look at that. Um, there's, there's guidance on that. There's evidence-based guidance on that. So real quick, we're going to, we're, we're ending at one, right? So we have a little bit of time here. We have a poll. If you'll just answer this real quick, um, how much influence do you have? Do you feel like you have to adopt and implement this model policy that, that we've been reviewing in your district or in your environment, your school? How much influence do you feel like you have to, to do something with this? We'll leave that open for just a little bit, huh? And I guess that one is the least amount of influence and 10 is the most amount of influence. So 10 high influence, one low in influence. So we're pretty scattered all over the place here too. Almost everybody. Okay, so on the side of not a ton of influence is what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing here. So before we do the chat box, um, I want to address the influence question. What I like to ask is if we don't have a policy or procedures in place for suicide prevention, um, mental health promotion, reentry after a suicide attempt or a su what to do after a suicide, if we don't have those things in place or we do <clears throat> have something in place, is what we're doing best practice? Is it evidence-informed or evidence-based? Is it what we did the best we could with um, however long ago we wrote it up, we did the best that we could possibly could, and now I found out there's something better that's already been done that's evidence-based, and those four big organizations put together and collaborated on, does it make more sense to use that or integrate what we have into that so that if anything ever were to go wrong, we would know that we did our best. Um, I've worked places where I was given the sheet of questions to ask a student that might be suicidal. And my first question was always, where did these come from? Who wrote them? And why am I asking them? Um, because those are very important questions. And what next steps will I take? And why will I be taking those? And who's going to support me in that? And who's going to be part of that? If those questions can't be answered, then we need to bulk up that policy and write some procedures so everybody knows what to do. And what we're doing is best practice for suicide prevention, because if it's not best practice, 
you can really start talking about liability. And don't we just want to protect our students the best we can anyway, obviously. So I always ask, well, what we're doing seems like it's been working all right, but is it the best we can do? And where did all that come from? So um, just wanted to throw that out there. All right, so next slide. So in thinking about influence, um, I, you know, we hear this a lot, a lot of folks saying, well, I don't really think it is my job to influence policy, influence change, influence whatever it is. It, I would encourage you to think about that and really reconsider that because it absolutely is. We talked about that involvement and everybody being involved and and it absolutely is this, and we've seen this. We've seen um, teachers, we've seen school counselors go to their district and say, hey, this is something we wanna implement, this is something we wanna put in, and they've done it. Um, so I wanna remind you absolutely of the influence that you do have. So um, another activity to close us out and things to think about, what, where do we go from here? Um, we've listened to Victoria and I talk about the model policy and you're thinking, yes, this is absolutely what we want to have. Is something that's already done. Why wouldn't we implement this? Where would where would where do we go from here? What are our next steps? So three words or less. Take a minute. Type into the chat box, and I see some already. About what are our next steps? What do we do within our district, within our school, to be able to implement this and go even farther? So I see revi um, revision of task force. Um, our district uh, has a confidential referral process for staff and a robust employee assistance program. That's wonderful. Part of new employee orientation um, and this staff help and referral info sent out monthly in the form of a newsletter. That's wonderful. Um, somebody wanting to bring QPR to their program and start to develop solid suicide prevention team. Reviewing protocol and educating all staff. Absolutely. Um, both Victoria and I are master trainers in QPR and a lot of times they go, okay, well, you know, come to our school. We want to do QPR for all of our school counselors. QPR is meant for non-mental health professionals. And yes, that's great for your mental health professionals too, but we want to train everybody because think about it. Who's the, who are, who's the number one person that kids in the school talk to? Sometimes that is food service staff. Sometimes that's the bus driver, right? We want to educate everybody. There's somebody saying they started staff QPR in March. That's awesome. I'm hoping they can pick that back up. That is something we're in a virtual world right now and things are changing and it's crazy and we're adapting. Um, there's a lot that, be, that can be done virtually to include QPR. I know Victoria also talked about in our last presentation, we have a school who are absolute rock stars who got together and did the shape assessment and they did it all virtually. Um, you know, really starting with, we have in the chat box, reviewing and making the district and uh, school safety plans more robust and starting and reviewing what is in your school safety plan and how do we add to that? Absolutely. A lot of times, you know, again, it's going back to, you know, who can I talk to? Who's the decision maker within my school? And instead of just saying, hey, well, I think we should do this. Well, hey, I think we should do this. And here's the model policy that I think we should use, right? It's bringing that product back and saying, this is what we want to do, right? Um, get buy-in from admin, right? Um, so absolutely, it's getting that buy-in and, and we're here to help you in any way. OSA's role, um, the Office of School and Adolescent Health, we're not here to tell anybody what to do set any restrictions or monitor anybody, we're here as a resource. Um, we have done that on many different levels. We've been asked to go in and sit in a meeting with administration or district um, that's led by the person who contacted us, whether that was a school nurse or a school counselor or a teacher, saying, hey, I really want this, but I want your support. We present it to school boards. We really want to be able to support and give you the tools, give you the resources, the evidence-based stuff that you can then go back and say, hey, I want this for my school. And like I said, you know, there are districts that we've seen that go all the way up and make district-wide change. Um, 
I, I also want to highlight, and this is outside of the school example, but I want to hi highlight within CYFD, the juvenile justice services. Um, phenomenal people said, hey, you know what? We need to be doing more with suicide prevention. And we saw policy change all the way up to the top for all CYFD juvenile justice staff to get trained. They've changed their policy. They've changed their assessments. They've changed everything from one person saying, hey, this means something to me and I want to see change. So I encourage you to utilize the help that's there. We're absolutely here to help you go in, look at that policy. Yes, it's long, but familiarize yourself with it and then start talking about it and start talking to those district leaders, those folks who can affect change because that change is going to come from you, right? Anything you'd like to add into that, Victoria? Sure. Um, question of, are police ideal people to be dealing with suicide ideation and threats? Absolutely not. They're law enforcement. I think very highly of law enforcement um, for uh, the jobs that they do is law enforcement. And um, they can be a cooperating partner in suicide prevention. And and I know that some are, and um, you know, like some people don't know every single state club. So there are partners in preventing suicide in that way. But if you're talking about dealing with suicide ideation, and I don't really like the word threats um, just because it stigmatizes suicidality, but um, suicide ideation should be dealt with by ideally, hopefully, mental health staff at the school, if this is occurring at the school. But there, sometimes there's a time and place when we're trying to locate people or if there's an, an imminent danger, immediate danger type of issue, but um, that's going to look different each place depending on what your relationships are with your local law enforcement and how they play into your school environment. Um, there was talk about uh, suicidal staff or losing staff to suicide um, in your school safety plans. There should be a, a broad, deep um, recovery plan of when a tragedy happens and it impacts your school community, what you're going to do in an evidence informed way. So that's where that would go. And then in um, their most school districts have an employee or staff handbook. And in there, some folks have uh, employee assistance program services, some don't, but there should be uh, a process, a policy and a procedure for what to do when any staff member is in danger from a lot of different things. Um, if somebody has a heart attack in the classroom, if a, if a staff member doesn't report um, being absent and they don't come and people are worried about them, what's going to happen? That should be in the staff handbook. So um, those are things that need to be included for sure. Um, there was also, let's see, oh, self-harm and cutting. Really, um, that's a route that you, you start and you need to find out if somebody's self-injurious behavior, whatever it is, um, burning, cutting, et cetera, high risk taking. We need to first find out about what they were trying to do. And the only way to try it, to find out if somebody meant to die by suicide by, from what they did is to ask them. And so we need to determine if they wanted to die or not. And then that's where we're gonna branch into different procedures because if they didn't want to die, then we're not gonna automatically treat them as if they're suicidal, but we're still gonna tend to their, obviously their immediate um, health issues if they, have, if they have any, you know, immediate medical issues, um, they're actively bleeding or something like that, or they have an infection or what have you, you need to address those things first, but we need to die. And that tells you whether that was a suicidal behavior or not. Okay, so that puts us down two different roads and your policies and procedures are gonna need to direct you on what happens down each one of those paths. And I know that's a general answer to a pretty specific question, but I can't tell you what your district and your school should do other than determine and not blanketly assume that all self-injurious behavior is suicidal because it's not. And there's a very large body of research um, that backs that up. So um, we would love to hear from all of you if you need assistance locating this model or, or using it or integrating what you policy that you already have in place with this model policy language. We'd love to hear from you. That's um, a big part of what we do is help with that kind of thing. And um, we're just really glad that you were able to spend time here with us. I just want to reference everybody to the QR code up on your slide. Um, we are so grateful 
for you taking the time today to hang out with us and talk about this. Um, the Office of School and Adolescent Health puts out a quarterly OSA brief. There are resources, training bulletins, regional updates. Um, again, a reminder, we are statewide. There's a variety of different resources. Everything that we put out is free. So that is a reminder to you all as well. Um, just want to thank you again so much for spending the time with us today. And we're here to help in any way that we can. Thank you.